I'll, I'll make sure that's recording. So we could just, uh, we're gonna pull up a little slide here and just make sure that everybody sees that. Um, if you can go down to the, to the slide okay. to pull up the questions. Just wanted to uh, go down to the slide to ask right here. Perfect. All right. So as everybody is piling in, we'll give it uh, we'll give it a minute or two. But uh, before we even introduce ourselves, we just want to know about you, uh, your first name, where you're from, what grades and courses that you teach. If you could put it in the chat box, we would love to see that. Uh, this whole thing is going to be interactive. So we've got incredible. Uh, artists, we've got visual artists, um, we've got uh, musical artists tonight, we've got incredible uh, gospel and uh, and blues and soul artists that are going to be talking about their history and their background knowledge on American blues and roots music. So this is going to be really fun. Let's see. Adam, I'll, I'll kind of let you take this here. Who you see? All right, we have a few people. We have Scarlett from Virginia Beach. Welcome, welcome, Virginia Beach. Um, we're feeling some Virginia Beach weather up here in the East Coast. It was like 60, mid 60s today. Um, we have Jazz from Texas. Hello, wow. hello, hello. Scott from Farmington Hills in Michigan. Wow, Michigan is in the building. Then we have Chris from San Francisco. Wow. Hi, hello, 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 everyone. We have JR from Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Okay, we got a lot, a lot of folks in here. We got Brady from Green Lake, hello, hello. Noah from Boston, Dwight, J Virginia Beach is in the house. Virginia Beach is in the oh, house tonight, guys. That's Virginia right. Beach in the house. We have Kansas City, Missouri, Missouri yes. Um, Noel, I, I want to say your name wrong. I think that was it. We have Naomi from, I think it's Wyoming or Wisconsin. We have so many. I'm trying to read and scroll and scroll. We have Roger. Roger. Hello. Hello. And we have Dave, David from Tacoma. Wow. Okay. We have, we have a bunch, a bunch of different states that are in, that are here. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it, it's it's amazing to see the ability for so many different people to now be gathering. I'm still kind of in awe of that thought process that so many people can gather all together from different states, different parts of the country, different countries. Uh, we have Ellen from New Hampshire. Hello, Ellen. Nice to meet everyone. Nice to virtually meet everyone. Okay, perfect. Well, that's a, a little uh, preview into Adam Taylor. You're going to be seeing a lot of him tonight and uh, in the later, uh, in the early evening for some of you out there as well. So um, we're going to get started. We're going to start this process. We are the Blues and Beyond. My name is Eric Finland, and I am the program director. And in 2020, during the height of the pandemic, we as a program decided that this was a perfect time to teach what we had been doing in the schools remotely. And uh, since then, we have really adapted to a remote teaching um, environment and because that has worked very well. And uh, there's live narrators that we use in the classes. We use special guests. We use uh, incredible masterclass artists uh, that you're going to see tonight. So um, I wanted to just dive right in. I know some people are still kind of piling in, but uh, there are three overarching beliefs that really led to the creation of this program. And Adam, as you can uh, go back to the top as we already got some of the answers from where people are from, um, we have these three beliefs that led to the creation of this program. And these three things really drive our efforts to deliver this program. That's myself in the corner and I'm gonna uh, in a second, introduce everybody else. I myself am a music director. I've uh, traveled around the world with different gospel, soul, and blues, and jazz artists as a Hammond organist. And uh, I have studied at Berklee College of Music and um, 
and I got my master's at SUNY Purchase in New York in African American history and jazz studies. So the three beliefs uh, that have driven this program, the first is that African American history must be taught throughout the entire year. It's America's history. It's an integral to the entire story and it should be part of all U.S. history courses for the entire year. The second is that African American music is embedded in the American journey from pre-1600s. So we have to go before the slave trade. We have to talk about the kings and queens. We have to talk about the culture that came from West Africa and, and all over Africa and, and the music and, and the rhythms and the food and, and all of these things that um, really we see in our culture today. And so we, we cannot separate the music from the story or the story from the music, that, that history that is. So we have to talk about them hand in hand. The third is that teaching music through history and history through music has been a really powerful way to deliver all of the units that we teach about because we all know that music has the power to heal. It has the power to grab students' attention when we talk about uh, really tough topics like the Tulsa Massacre. Uh, we talk about the music that was happening around it at the time. So we're going to go back tonight and we're going to talk about the roots of American music, where all this came from, uh, all of our rich American music that we know and love today. So it's the live talent that really makes this program what it is. So we'll go to the next slide and uh, let's look at who we have in the program and who's going to be talking today. So with us, we have Adam Taylor, the director of narration. He and I are, um, we are gangbusters. We're, we're a team. We, we are the uh, rhythm section of the AME Church in Norwalk, Connecticut. Adam is the choir director. I am the organist and the music director. And Adam is also a pastor at his family's church. Um, he's singing for Timothy Wright. Uh, Natalie Wilson. Uh, also, he sang for uh, Clay Aiken on American Idol, and Adam is such an integral part of this team. So you will see Adam in a little bit. We'll go to the next slide, please. And we have Jocelyn Pleasant. She is our master class percussionist. She is a drummer, educator, uh, percussionist, band leader, uh, and she's from Middletown, Connecticut. And um, she is currently pursuing her PhD in ethnomusicology at Wesleyan University. Uh, she has performed with so many people from uh, Kim Clark, Jamie Daubert, uh, Tanya Darby, and others. She has an incredible band that she really uh, is able to teach a lot of this music that you're going to be hearing uh, through her performances, and that's called The Lost Tribe. And uh, I would love to hear about that tonight and have her uh, explain that and tell us what they do with that music that she performs. So as an educator, she's been on staff with so many schools, um, the Institute for Musical Arts, uh, the Greater Hartford Academy and others. So we're going to hear from her and she's going to be playing some percussion for us and showing us where these instruments come from. Next slide. Uh, Kevin Pullen is our masterclass visual artist. Ke Kevin is originally from Plainfield, New Jersey, but he currently lives in St. Simons Island, Georgia. He is our Gullah Island artist, and he'll talk about his connection to the Gullah Islands. Um, he is currently the artist in residence at the College of Coastal Georgia, and he teaches at the Golden Isles Career Academy. So he is our visual masterclass artist. He's going to be talking about some of his sculptures and how they relate to Gullah Geechee culture. So we'll go to the next slide. And finally, we have Jim Clifford. He's the head of curriculum. He is the curriculum developer for a lot of these uh, lesson plans that we've all worked on together. He is really, um, when we talk about the uh, compelling and the supporting questions that you see, uh, everything Jim does is based off of the inquiry-based method. So he'll talk a little bit about that. We're so excited to have him as a part of the team. Um, 29 years as a social studies teacher, uh, he has written curriculum for the Mystic Seaports Amistad website. Uh, if you all aren't aware, the uh, Mystic Seaport has an exact replica of the Amistad ship um, that is harbored there, and Jim uh, wrote the curriculum for that. Uh, the founder and president of Teaching Justice, a nonprofit that brings together urban and suburban students for social justice, um, and he is a member of the Connecticut Steering Committee for the revision of the K-12 through social studies standards. Uh, which a lot of that is uh, reflected in what we do, as you'll see. And we'll go to the next slide. Great. I'm going 
to pass the baton to Adam Taylor, our head of narration. Adam, I'll let you take it. Oh, hello again. Um, how we like to start everything off um, is we like to start everything off with music. Our program is music and history and the story behind it. Uh, we really like to deal with the thought process that our goal, like Eric said, is to make sure that music is taught or African-American history is taught throughout the year, not just one month out of the year. Um, you know, throughout the past couple of years, you know, there's been a lot of hurt and things that are happening in our world. And there's no better way than to heal that through music and through the, the power of music. So we will be teaching a lot of this history and music in, in conjunction. And so with that thought process in mind, a lot of what I do is, is mixed in with that musical um, history element. So I would, I would say that I was raised in the black church, which you'll find out today has a lot of influence in history. And so I was raised on singing songs like, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. Oh, God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. So I grew up singing those songs in the church. And little to my knowledge, eventually I would find out just how important those songs were, just how amazing and how far back the 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 lineage of those songs and where they come from and where they all started and that leads us to talking about what we're going to be dealing with today or tonight um for some is west african roots of american music a song like that was a field holler song that they would sing while they were working in the fields it had so many different other meanings but it didn't even start there it started way back in west africa with all the amazing music and history and songs that they were telling and singing and then we're also going to talk about the untold history of the Gullah Geechee people that is one thing that i'm recently learning about more i'm learning more and more about because it's it's known, but I think we really are gonna dive into it a little bit more and sink our teeth into it a little bit more. So maybe you're thinking to yourself, why? Why, why music? Music is our primary cultural source that can provide teachers with a novel way to engage students with historical issues, to get them to practice skills of analysis and to promote cross-cultural understanding. What makes uh, what makes music a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful primary source for students to investigate is its accessibility, especially if the instructor provides historical context and some questions to guide their inquiry. Music grabs their attention. It is expressive, 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 and arouses emotional states of awareness. And we have found throughout doing this program, no matter where it's at, no matter what genre, no matter what arena, that music is that thing that grabs attention and allows for, I think, a deeper understanding and a deeper feeling of the history that's being expressed throughout our program. So this, that's why music, that's why we call, we call the music is the vehicle that we're using to bring history to so many different people and bring all different types of history and history that maybe people aren't aware of. So let's continue on. African-Americans have expressed themselves from field toddlers, like the song I sang, Wade in the Water, to camp meetings, to spirituals, and the blues, to rap and hip hop today. It is all connected, again, starting way back in West Africa, it all leads up to today in our music and our history today. It is impossible, and I mean absolutely impossible. It's absolutely impossible to separate the music from the story or the story from the music. You can't, you can't separate them. So again, as you see, that's me, Adam Taylor, and that is our masterclass African percussionist, Jocelyn Pleasant. And I'm going to take this time to toss it to her. She is absolutely phenomenal. And she is, I think you guys are gonna really enjoy all that she is going to talk about when you talk about Senegal, Gambia, Sierra Leone, and so many different things in the instrumentation. So at this time, I'm going to pass it to our amazing, amazing masterclass artist, 
Jocelyn Pleasant. Take it away, Jocelyn. Good evening, everybody. Um, before um, I get started with a little bit of um, kind of show and tell with some of these instruments and things that I have, um, I'd like to let um, Jim talk a little bit about the questions that you see on this slide that are going to govern what it is that I that I want to talk about with it with these instruments and how um, you might be able to you know take away a little bit of something not only with the music that I'm playing but how it connects to a larger subject. So I want to let Jim talk a little bit first, and then we'll come back to me. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, good evening, everybody. It's really good to have you here. Um, so, like many of you, um, when the C3 framework or the inquiry approach came around. Um, I tried it with my students and it, it just transformed the classroom. Uh, for those who have not, are not familiar with it, uh, it engages students, it invites them to grapple with challenging content in ways that are relevant and authentic. So today's compelling question that we're using, and this is a sample, by the way, of what students would see in the classroom when, when we go there. So today's uh, compelling question is, in the struggle to overcome injustice, how have people used music to convey their stories and to change history? So you'll notice that this is an open-ended question it, and it can be approached from different perspectives. So that's, that's the mark of a, of, of a good compelling question. So now students, what they will do is they will then address the supporting questions. And for those who are not familiar with the process, the supporting question is one that unlike the compelling question, it's quite specific. It, it's, it has factual answers. Students will work individually or in small groups and they feel a sense of competence because they can find the material. And in the course of tonight's workshop, we urge you to follow, as you follow along, keep these supporting questions in mind because that's what we're gonna be covering. So today's supporting questions, quite frankly, the uh, describing the roles and influence of the griots, you'll learn a lot about them. Um, Something that came to mind as we were creating those lessons is, are the griots in, in the United States? You know, if you understand the role of the griot, and then you look at um, examples through our history and, and today, um, you'll, you'll see them here. And then finally, how did instruments enhance storytelling in West Africa? And that is what Jocelyn will be uh, presenting to us. we can uh, move on to the next slide. Um, so the first thing I want to talk a little bit about, and you see a picture of it there um, on your screen, are different categories um, of instruments and um, how they're divided um, by a classification system. Actually, literally, in my ethnomusicology classes, we talk about this very thing. So this is near and dear to my heart. But um, the four major categories of instruments that you'll find really around the world, but also within West African instruments, you'll find aerophones. And aerophones are instruments that make a note um, from having air blown through it, a trumpet, um, a saxophone, a clarinet, things of that nature. A chordophone um, is something which amplifies the vibration of a string, which is which when it is plucked. Ooh, if I can talk. Um, so that would be something like a guitar for most of us, maybe a banjo, another instrument I'm going to talk about later. I'll come back to that term. Uh, membranophone is uh, an instrument where um, a sound is produced by the striking of a drum head made from dried animal skin. I will put my camera down so you can see that in a moment, but I have plenty of those for you. And an idiophone is something, um, an instrument, I should say, that produces sound um, by shaking, striking, scraping something of that nature um, i'm pretty sure i'm going to come back to that as well so if we can move on to the next slide just so you kind of have those categories um, in your head um, the next thing i really want to talk about are this idea of the griots and the different instruments that they use so the griots are a very special group of people um, that reside still to this day within west africa um, within different countries of west africa um, and they are a part of a caste system. So within West Africa, there's different castes of people. Um, and does it, well, uh, thank you for that question. See, is it Mbira, what was that? In Mbira, what was that? I'll, I'll come back to that, but- um, well, I'll, I'll read it. He said, does an Mbira fit under the idiophone? It does. Now, some instruments also fit under multiple categories. So I think that's another, that's another thing to consider as well. 
Um, so as far as the griots, um, they are the historians, the musicians, and the storytellers of their community. They are a cast, um, just like the noble people are a cast, just like another group of people are a cast. And their occupation is passed down from father to son. And I will also qualify that to say mother to daughter because women are also griots and um, over countless generations. And it's taught through oral tradition. So nothing is written down. Um, so when something isn't written down, it's very important to really um, embrace and try to understand what it is to pass down something from family member to family member. Griots are also families. They, they are not mixed and matched amongst people in the community. And um, all their storytelling and music is used to preserve history, traditions, and identity. Um, and so as I, as I further mentioned, um, the system and this oral tradition has to do with being within your family and spending hours being Im really immersed in culture. It's not something that, you know, you choose to separate yourself from, or I'm gonna go have this occupation over here, or I'm just gonna go be a doctor over here. It's something that you live with every day. So they, they consider it to be in you. There's a term in the blood that they use. So when you're born, you can only be born um, into griot cast of people um, and not even, you know, marry into, the, they also marry within other griot um, families. So if we can continue to the next slide. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the instruments that are used within um, the griots as they are storytellers. Again, the men and the women are storytellers. Uh, more often than not, being a griot is a very gendered exercise where the women um, sing and dance and that's their role within being a griot. And the men traditionally play the instruments. Um, and so some of the instruments are the kora, which maybe you've heard of, the balafone, which I'll show you momentarily, the ingoni, and the ingoni is um, the ancestor to uh, the banjo. So that would be, uh, what was that, the idiophone, the, the one that, something that you pluck. And then also the voice, uh, the voice kind of being the focal point and the main uh, instrument of the griot because their storytelling is what keeps them going. Um, and in certain cases with the griot, the uh, percussion instruments such as the dunun and the tama, which I don't have with me, can also be used to accompany griot music. Um, so for example, and this is where I want to teach you guys a little bit, this is going to be a little audience participation. There's a celebra celebratory rhythm and song for the griots that's called lamban. And then those other words that you see there are also names that you might um, see from time to time for lamban. Something that happens with oral history is that there can be different names, but they refer to the same thing. And so don't let the, don't let that fool you sometimes as you, uh, if you come across different teachers from different places within West Africa, um, a lot of the same principles are spread out amongst various groups of people and it'll have different names, but the underlying principle and the rhythm will be the same thing. So Lamba is also known as Jelly Don, Jelly being the word for griot, Don being the word for dance. It's also called Sandia are also Sanja. And uh, Lamba was traditionally played on the balafone, but has since been adapted to the djembe ensemble. And if we could put the slide down just so I can see myself. Can you, would you be able to put the slide off just so I can make sure if everybody can see me? If you could put it in the chat, give me a Looks thumbs good. up. Like Looks good. Oh, you, can, you, can, you can lower the camera just, just so we could see the calf skin. Just there, perfect. Oh, there we go. Nice. Do I need to back up a little bit? You're good. Okay, perfect. So this drum I have in front of me is called a djembe. And um, as Eric mentioned, this is a calf skin on top of this djembe. Sometimes it's goat skin. Um, and everything about this djembe is handmade. All of the rope, all of the carving, everything that happens on the inside of the djembe. It's all humanly made. It's not made by a machine. And so um, what I want to teach you is a little rhythm on this djembe that goes with lamban. And then um, I, want you to, I want you to play along with me. So the signal to start lamban goes like this. So what I want you to do is when I put my hand here, I want you to do it with me. Let's see what we got. Let's try it again. One more time, even though I can't see you. So that's how Lamba starts. 
Now, here's what the djembe does after this note in the middle. So you can try it on your lap with me. I'll play the signal, and let's see what we got. So I'm going to slow that down. First note, second notes, here that is again. And the last part goes like this. And that's four notes. One, two, three, four. One, one, two. One, two, three, four. Boom. One, two. So that's a little bit of the djembe. So I'm gonna move on quickly to a few other instruments for you. I have this drum here, which is called the kinkini. And the kinkini has a bell on the top. I play with my drumstick on the side and I let it be nice and loose. And the kinkini goes. want to do that with me you can go like this a couple more times so that's our kinkini part all of this vocabulary and the way that I'm spelling that will get put in the chat so you can see um, you know what these instruments are called and how they're how they're spelled so this drum here and again, let me know if you can see it or not. I'm gonna hold it up first. I know I'm blocking my face. Now I'm not. So I wanna let you see everything about this drum. There's rope tuning on the side. This is two, um, two headed drum. This is a little bit thicker cow skin on this drum. And this drum is the Dunoon. And the dunun is what is that word that you see there um, that is actually can be uh, used as a uh, griot, that can be used as a griot instrument um, in some different castes. Remember I said, depending on what country, depending on what ethnic group, some of them do use the dunun as a, as a griot instrument along with the kora, the balafon, so on and so forth. The djembe is actually not traditionally a griot instrument. It's something that got... Um, put together with the griot instruments over time and uh, in different performances. But traditionally speaking, the djembe belongs to a caste known as the numu and the numu are the blacksmith people. Um, so the blacksmiths are actually the people uh, within the Mande um, ethnic group that are um, considered the inventors of the djembe. And so the dunun, has a little bit of a, an improvisatory role within Lamban, um, and it doesn't play quite the same static pattern that you would hear on the kinkini or on the djembe. So that's the dunu. And last but not least, if I can move my camera a little bit. Again, let me know if you can see. Can everybody see this instrument here? Yeah, you can, you can lower it just a hair and that would be perfect. Out there. Good. So, like a xylophone. Absolutely. This is the ancestor to the xylophone, the ancestor to the marimba that you've uh, probably heard and seen. And what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to hold this up so you can see the bottom of it. So, the bottom of this instrument, this is all gourds, all gourds of different shapes, different sizes, and they're tied under here with a very specific uh, time system that I personally do not have the patience to do myself. So anytime something goes wrong with my gourd, I take it to my guy and he fixes it. But um, what, is the, what is the name of this instrument? The name of this instrument is the balafone. So I mentioned the balafone earlier, and there's a system of gourds underneath this balafone. And the balafone is the traditional instrument that plays lamban. <laughs> This happens
happens to be tuned um, like more like a piano, but uh, traditionally speaking, there's lots of different tunings that you can have, different notes, different systems, so on and so forth. And so what I'd like to do now is uh, go on to the next slide because I want to show you what it looks like when you put all of those different parts together. So that's a little demonstration of Lambon with all the different um, with all the different parts that I showed you, the djembe, the kinkini, the dunun, and the balafon all together. So within that music that uh, you just heard for Lambon, I'm sure you heard little bits and pieces and elements of different music that you know you might hear in different uh, types of music that you hear in the Americas now, in the United States, South America, um, in the Caribbean. So not only are the instruments of the Senegambia, Senegal and the Gambia, from Mali and Guinea, from Sierra Leone, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, all of those places uh, where people, um, you know, were forcibly brought to this country, they, those, those different um, elements and those different musics all were blended together and have manifested and changed and turned into something different and turned into different styles of music that we hear today. Um, if you can move on to the next um, slide for me. So the idea of the griot as the storyteller also um, is prevalent today, I would argue. Um, and so you have it, I would say, um, more obviously in, in a genre um, called jazz music and somebody that um, considered themselves a griot and had music um, to that effect was Dr. Billy Taylor, as you see there on the slide, and someone who um, currently has another project out about being a griot and doing different interviews and kind of documenting jazz history is um oh his name went out my head um who am i thinking of that has the uh that has the griot um series out now if i think of it i'll, I'll put it in the type i'll put it in the chat for you um but the, that idea of being a griot is very important still within um at, within african-american culture and i you know argue that it's not only about you know, uh, changing history. It's about maintaining history. It's about maintaining something that could be broken otherwise if uh, people don't consider it sacred. And so the idea of being a griot is about not only changing history, it's about maintaining and not letting um, history and people and culture be lost, but it's about letting it uh, maintain and persist and then growing and changing. And so if you can move on to the next slide, I believe there's going to be another um, kind of conversation that Jim is going to lead about Amanda Gorman and do we consider her to be a griot? Okay. Thank you, Jocelyn. Let me, uh, oops, let me just start the video. Apologies there. Um, yeah, so when, when we work on these projects with students, one of the, one of the benefits of using the, um, the inquiry approach is that you wanna to try to connect them when possible to people that are closer in age to the students, um, people that they may have heard of or been familiar with. And so um, Amanda Gorman really burst on the scene um, when she did the inaugural poem at uh, President Biden's inauguration ceremony. And um, it caused not only myself, but my students uh, to go and look into her background. And there's actually a quote here from another, um, uh, from a TED talk that she gave, and we can uh, put the TED talk available to you later in the, uh, in the chat. But, um, you know, she says, I am the daughter of black writers who are descended from freedom fighters who broke the chains, who changed the world. And she did that in, I think in so many ways and just, just captured the attention of so many people. So 
what I what we want you to do is, and if you've done distance learning like I have for uh, you know a certain amount of time, it's nice to take a little break midway through and have a chance to talk with some of your peers. So I'm going to set up some uh, breakout rooms, and you'll just be you know automatically teleported there. And the discussion question we have for you is, how have griots used their experiences and their talents to convey their stories? And also, as um, Jocelyn said, to, to maintain their history, to convey and maintain that history. So um, just give me one moment. I'm going to set you into the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, into the breakout rooms. And you'll have uh, approximately five minutes to talk with others with you. And um, I will, if anyone has a question, uh, let me know. I can uh, take that before we begin. Otherwise, I'm going to send you into the rooms, and uh, I can also broadcast the question uh, through the uh, the feature so you can see that. Uh, and then finally, I'll give you uh, a warning when there's like a minute left to come back. Okay, here we go. So you'll have received the invite. If you would just click join, and you'll be taken to the room where you can discuss this with your peers. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we're closing the breakout rooms in uh, 45 seconds, and then we'll be ready to discuss these answers as people are starting to come back in from the breakout rooms. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that little break. And I, I popped in on one of the rooms, um, and uh, it was it was nice to have just that short discussion. Can we hear from uh, from a couple of people just some of the things you discussed? Uh, if you would share with us and uh, just give some nice feedback, please. Jim, the first thing I would like to do this is Charlie Episella. Um, a, a, one of my, the participants in my breakout room just asked a wonderful question, the, um, and I'm, I wasn't able to notice who asked the question, but they wanted to know if this idea of griots is something that is taught in music schools or if musicians, our peers in the music scene have a, a knowledge and a familiarity with a concept like who the griots are. And I thought that was a very compelling question. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I would on that matter defer to Jocelyn. Um, you have such a wealth of background in music, you could answer that best. Um, I would say absolutely that in, I, I certainly was taught that way um, as far as my own upbringing within learning um, jazz in particular and in learning African-American music and learning West African drumming. Um, the idea of a griot is always something that was um, put in my mind and something that is attached to being a griot that's also important is being an elder. And so mm. being someone who's, um, an elder and is respected in the community for their knowledge and for their experience, their life experience is also something that's um, very important. And of course, having respect for your elders and for, for them being the people that you go to when you want to know the answer to a question or, or, or find out a particular bit of information. And again, um, as far as, like I say, maintaining um, the history of people that is not written down, it's so very important to have this idea of music and storytelling and vocalization um, that helps. So that's something that absolutely came across my table um, as some, um, you know, as a youth learning this type of music. Very cool. Other questions or comments? You know, may I ask uh, either, um, let's see, in the room with me was Bergen or Will? You guys had some good insights. Would you, uh, Bergen, would you wish to share the thought that you shared about what you do with your students? We had somebody, uh, Scott said, is it true that leaders occasionally feared griots because of their wealth of knowledge? That's another Jocelyn uh, answer. Is it true that leaders occasionally feared griots because of their wealth of knowledge? That's, um, that's absolutely, there's some truth to that. Um, it's um, it's not a, always a fear. There's definitely, um, I think, just a, a respect factor because depending mm -hmm. upon, um, again, the ethnic group, the country, the different uh, society that you're living in, uh, griots do hold different kind of societal positions. 
Um, and it's not always necessarily the highest position, uh, believe it or not, you know, because the griots aren't the people that necessarily have the money and the wealth in that respect mm -hmm. to be able to be people that control society, but them having the particular knowledge and understanding um, is is a kind of wealth in and of itself. And so it, it is respected. And yes, to an extent feared, but not uh, not wholly, um, not wholly feared. But there there is definitely some truth to kind of um, fearing the griot. I, I kind of think in a healthy way, actually, I'll put it that way. Mm. Yeah, may I may I join the discussion on that? Uh, that's a great question. I think as the way you phrased the question too, Provided the leader is acting consistent with the values and the traditions of the country, there's probably not so much to be feared. But if the leader were to depart from there and act in self-interest or counter to the, to the common good or the traditions of the people, um, my understanding is that's where the griot would, would perhaps uh, speak up on that. Um, even if not publicly, um, if he had the ear of the decision makers. Yeah, and again, it's a, it's a he or it's a he or she. Um, Thank you. My, my situation in yeah. this, one. yeah, you know, I have to. Of course, I have to. I have my to bad. point that out that that with that women, older women who are our griots are 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 very very well respected um, within within communities, within families, um, sometimes even more so than the men, because again, this idea of singing and vocalization is, is paramount to being a griot. Um, the instruments, of course, are still important, but the way that you are able to vocalize, and I, I was in a room and they were talking about poetry, and that's a very good parallel to draw because being a griot is like being a poet, because you are you're remembering stories, but you're not exactly repeating it in the same way that someone told you. You're you're giving creative license, and you're you're a performer um, in that way as well. So yeah, you are also being a poet, and you're also taking some creative license with the particular stories of your community, of your elders. Um, there's a there's griot songs about the balafone in particular, the very first balafone, and how that came to be, and the kora, and how that came to be. So all of those things have been passed down for so many generations. And you know, it's not the same words every single time. And so griots and especially women griots are revered for the way that they're able to sing and for the way that they're able to convey that information through song. Beautiful. And thank you for catching that. That's, it's something that you see pictures of men as griots and, and it's like, you don't really think of that because it's, it, the image is of a man, but to, to hear that kind of, we know that you've, you've played you've played with griots in in africa you've you've experienced it and you've seen it firsthand and so that that is really that's really moving to know that that element is something that's not as uh covered and it should be it should the spotlight should be more on that um i think it's a great time to move on um we've got some incredible answers and we also have another whole nother lesson plan so i want to thank jocelyn for uh walking us through that entire segment thank you so much jocelyn i i get chills every time you play the balafone it's just that instrument just hits you deep in the core something about that instrument it's just it's oof, it's it's deep yes we have oh one more let's just read this last comment there are traditions of this sort of roland that role in many cultures uh, Samuel in Israel is an example, correct, started the school of the prophets and taught music as the focus of communication. He was either revered or feared by whatever side you were on in terms of cultural standards. Wow. Yeah. So that, uh, that really wraps up that segment. Incredible answers. Thank you all so much. Let's get to uh, Adam. We're going to have you take over the next segment and introduce our Gullah and Geechee Masterclass artists. Great, thank you. Um, great conversations, um, great feedback, uh, just amazing, amazing. I love, I love these kind of conversations. So I tend to stay a little bit more quiet because I can just go and go and go and go and go. But our next piece of music and history is the history of the Gullah Geechee people. And for this segment, we are going to bring up um, I just met him recently this past year or two years. 
and he is phenomenal as well, just as all our masterclass artists. Um, again, thank you, Jocelyn, for that amazing, amazing demonstration, all your wealth of knowledge. But to, right now, we're going to bring up Mr. Kevin Pullen. He is our masterclass visual artist, and he does amazing work. You're going to see some of his work, and he's going to talk about the Gullah Geechee culture and give you a little bit of a deep dive into it. So, Kevin, take it away. Hello, everyone. And uh, I think the first thing I'm not to do is put it in the second gear because I'm revving in third. I am excited to be here. Uh, I want to make sure I'm not jabbering too fast and kind of keep it in check here. I'm Kevin Pullen. You're I am good. A, I'm you're a good. visual. You, you have time, Kevin. You, you're good. Okay. I'm a visual artist. And um, part of what I do, part of what I've discovered actually about myself is that I am a griot. Uh, and the idea of griot for me and the whole concept came very late in life, I mean, very late. Uh, from New Jersey, lived in Boston, lived in Miami, lived in Atlanta, and then from Atlanta at one point moved here to where I am now in St. Simon's Island. And this is where, in this particular region where I moved to, just happenstance, found out that this is the area where my ancestors came in to Georgia. So there's a lot that I'll be finding out, a lot I'll be, I found out and I'll be sharing with you. Uh, as you look at that painting that's on the screen right now, um, yeah, that one, um, I will talk about that painting, but the significance of it is there's a lot that's in that painting that tells the real stories, the real process, the real experience of being African in the new world. Next slide. Yeah, that old plantation picture is famous. We're going to go into that a little bit. Uh, here's the compelling question that kind of uh, comes up here with the um, with this unit. In the struggle to overcome injustice, how have people used music to convey their stories and change history? Uh, Jim, this is your writing here. Um, and I know you've kind of put this together uh, really well. Uh, supporting questions that we kind of delve into really specifically is uh, number one, how did the Gullah and the Geechee people differ from other enslaved Africans living in the United States? Uh, there was a difference between these, cult these two cultures on how slavery actually happened in the U.S. and uh, what that difference was from, say, inland uh, and south and so forth. And the other question, how did music and art specifically convey these stories and improve and improve their lives? Uh, art had a, had a very strong presence in the Gullah and Geechee cultures, uh, not just in the visual arts itself, but in the applied arts. As you saw with the instruments that Jocelyn was playing, uh, those instruments are made by hand. They are crafted. And part of the, part of the griot's training in addition to the poetry, the song, the memorization, was the actual artistic crafting of those instruments. I thought that was very humbling. Jocelyn in a PhD studies would say, hey, I'm deferring to a master to put this instrument back together if I need some help with it or if it's not functioning with these gourds the way it needs to. Okay, let's move on. All right. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the Gullah and Geechee people, because we, a lot of times you'll hear us and see us say the Gullah Geechee people, and they are descendants from, uh, from, from, from Africans who were brought in as slaves and from particular areas uh, in, 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 in Africa to the U.S. Now, specifically in the map that's on, on the picture there, you'll see the map that goes from a very, very southern tip of North Carolina and the diagonal, as it comes down the page of the map, comes right down to the very, very northern tip of Florida. Significance of that is this. That area right there, and I happen to live right smack in the middle of that area there, it's often referred to as the low country. And it's low country for sea level, yes, but there's some specifics about that geography that are, 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 are important to the study of uh, our African culture and the slave culture there and the agriculture there. First of all, the Gullah, the Gullah people, the Gullah people um, are people from the Carolinas. So most of the Gullah culture was from Carolina, bottom North Carolina, and most of all of South Carolina. 
the Geechee culture was more of Georgia. And the Geechee culture pretty much in that area, going from Savannah, say the Savannah area, coming down to where I am in the St. Simons Island area and, and, and just a little south of there. So that's a, actually the difference where the two cultures are geographically within the US. However, the Gullah and Geechee do share very similar ling linguistic and artistic cultural traits. And those traits have remained very much intact in, the, in it, particularly in this region where I am at. Uh, a lot of what we know of as the culture of the language, the culture of the foods, the culture of, 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 of the arts is very much intact in these particular areas that I'm speaking of here on this coastal. That's different from say Alabama and Mississippi, Florida and other places where slavery was actually with slavery is actually manifesting and, and flourishing. With a different area, different culture, different climate, and different products that happen, and a different way of life. Next one. All right. Now, the first wave of enslaved Africans were right between the 17th and 18th century coming uh, into the low country of the U.S., that area that I just pointed on the map, coming from Angola and, and Republic of Congo. Most and most of their time that they were spending was clearing land, growing crops, raising livestock. That's what that's what the Africans who came in uh, to that area, that's what they do. Now, the second wave of enslaved Africans came from a different region, slightly different region, more of the Ivory Coast area of Senegambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia. That was the Windward Coast or the Rice Coast. And uh, so many of the enslaved Africans brought into South Carolina and Georgia in just a short period of time came from that area. Now, that particular area was known for its rice growing. And there was a reason that the, that the slavers were looking for people from that area. It was not just to get those slaves from the area there to do menial work. They were looking for slaves from that particular area because they knew those slaves were bringing skills. They knew those slaves were bringing a particular set of skills and particular knowledge base. And actually, the slave traders were willing to be able to sell and buy slaves from these areas for a different price, specifically for their skills in agriculture and specifically for their rice growing skills. Now, remember, I talked about where we're, this area we're talking about as the low country. If you think about that low country, it's kind of swampy. It's kind of, it, the, the, when the tides come in and come out, it's very much noticeable in this area, uh, not just the beach area, but that swampy area, which is sometimes referred to as marsh. Uh, flip, flip slide. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the, the slide that's on the screen here, but I'll talk a little bit more about that, that marshy area too. That marsh area specifically for rice growing was the same marshy area that Sierra Leone and so forth from Africa. So the slaves were coming in to an area that's very similar. Now, what's on your screen now is a particular slave incident. I would like to share this one with you. It's something that, um, that's close to me, not just artistically, but close to me, literally geographically. What you're, what you're looking at now is a sculpture and the sculpture is depicting a group of people called the Igbos. Now the Igbos were known for their free spirit in Africa. And some believe that lineage of the, Igbo, the Igbos traced back, back from Africa across the Sahara back to the wandering Israelites. Now, the Igbo landing, this incident specifically happened in 1803, and I'd like to share that with you. You'll see the caption at the top there said, the water spirit brought us, the water spirit will take us home. The water spirit brought us, the water spirit will take us home. This is the relevance to that Igbo, to that Igbo landing in that Igbo tribe that's, that's illustrated there. In May 1803, Captured members of the Igbo tribe from Nigeria area were brought to St. Simon's Island. Now, how did they get these particular Igbo there? Uh, according to the story, they were deceived. 
they weren't taken forcibly. They were deceived into believing they were going somewhere else. Now, when they arrived and discovered that they were being brought and were being brought into slavery, that's when the revolt happened. And three crew members from the ship that brought them were thrown overboard to their death. There was a violent revolt and the Africans took over that ship. Now, as they came ashore, those Africans, some of them were captured again and some actually were not. But as they came to shore and after that revolt, the Igbos realized that they were not, they were not going to be able to fight their way back into freedom. So collectively as a tribe, 10 to 15 of the Igbos walking together, committed together, walked into what was what's known as Dunbar Creek and drowned themselves. They would rather take their own lives than to give their lives to enslavement. Now, uh, that area of Dunbar Creek, I know it well. It's about, uh, it's about six miles from where I live. And there's a causeway that I ride over maybe three times a week uh, when I used to go to work, it was every day going through. And I would always see that, that very area where these Igbo tribes, where Igbo tribe members decided that they were going to commit this. And it's a, it's a stark reminder. It's very, very quiet, very, very peaceful area. But it is the place where those Africans decided that they were not going to be taken into slavery. Interesting to note that this story that you, I've just shared with you was held in legend and folklore for a lot of years. Probably, probably up until about 15, maybe 20 years ago. From what I was, from what I was told, the reason was because if the story of the Ebos got out, the slavers and the slave traders and the plantation owners would, would, would not, would not, would not, would not subscribe to having these rebellious, these rebellious Africans as workers on their plantation. So the story was kept as a secret. How do we know it today? We know it today in the account that we have here because the captain's log was discovered and the captain's log matched the story exactly. So, the, the water spirits brought us, the water spirits take us home. I'm just glad to let you, let you share into that story about the Igbo tribesmen and this sculpture here about uh, that incident. And also, um, right before we move to that, it's really important to note that Kevin did create that sculpture. I know he's very humble, but it's, it's very important to note that uh, looking at that sculpture, that, that comes from his hands and heart. Thank you, Eric. And it was, and a lot of that was literally that ride I would take to work looking over that creek. And, and then the day different that I didn't know and the day I did know looking at the creek, I never looked at it the same way again. And I was really compelled to do that sculpture. Thank you. Yep. Next one. Now, plantation life between um, the lowlands area, South Carolina and Georgia, um, that was not primarily cotton growing region not primarily tobacco, which grew a little better up north. Rice was the fundamental crop in the area that I'm in here in this low country area. There was one notable exception right by a place called Sea Island, which is probably no bigger than uh, maybe, a, geez, maybe a section of New York. Uh, there, was a, there was a cotton at Sea Island cotton that grew there, but above, but beyond that, it was the primary crop here was rice. Now, many of the Africans from that Rice Coast area, like I was telling you, not only had the skills for growing rice, which was, grow, again, growing in that swampy area, but they had the experience in dealing with the climate itself. And um, part of that degree of dealing with it was the ability to keep a bit of an immunity to the diseases that affected other people here. The Africans seem to have an immunity of sorts to malaria, to the mosquito, the mosquito-borne diseases. In this area here, during certain areas, the, the mosquito and net population are pretty are pretty vibrant, and uh, it takes it, it takes a strong constitution to deal with them sometimes. But as a result of that rice production process, the slaves themselves be, were, were were in service to making that rice crop. They knew the rotation of the crop. They knew how to grow it. They knew how to harvest it. They knew how to keep it from raining and washing away. 
And um, we'll talk a little bit also about the culture in this area, plantation life. Uh, plantation life in this area was task Matt was task oriented, not slave labor oriented. And that means that the slaves in the lowland area where I'm at were specifically grant, were specifically tasked with a particular work function for that day. You finish the function and you're done working. That means you have time for your family, time for your garden, time for your craft, and even time for handling your own business if you want to work and sell some of what you make, some of what you grow. So slaves here in this area aside from, in, in, excuse me, in contrast to slaves in other areas of the South, worked in a task system where they had liberties on their own time when that particular daily task was finished. Next slide. Here's a point that we want to really bring up and let you know that that, that, that particular process of growing the rice and cultivating, that was almost exclusively almost exclusively the skill sets of the African women in the culture, almost exclusively. Um, a lot of times the men, the men overshadowed the women on, 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 on work and, 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 and what they did. But in this, in, in this area, in this area, the women were the skilled, were the skilled workers. The women were the skilled agriculturalists. They were the ones who knew how to plant the rice. There's a technique that the that people did for rice planting that the women were, were gifted at, and that was coating the rice itself with a little bit of clay, with a little bit of the mud clay, because that clay itself would protect the white, would take, protect the rice and keep it from getting washed away and lost as, as, as a seedling and as, and as a crop to come up through that swampy area. So since it wasn't going into soil, but into that swamp, the women knew how to coat the rice in the clay and basically plant it into the marshy areas here in this region and keep it there. There was something that they did too in the process of putting that clay in, and that was with their feet. They would actually use the heel of, your, heel of their feet to actually get the opening into the ground below the water where that rice was going to go and get that coated rice coated in the clay to stick. So if you ever heard that expression of dig your heels in, that's where it came from, from the women who planted the rice in the Carolina and Georgia region where I live. Next one. Now, again, going back to that task system which I was talking to you about a little bit. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it, it, it is cool that the women were actually the experts and so much so that a woman's value not was basically placed on the skill sets that she had because the assumption that th there was that her skill sets were not as good as the man. In the rice area, they were better. Thank you, John. Uh, the task system for slave labor in the lowland was very much different, as I was saying before, from plantations because of that, that requirement to do that particular task. So rather than working all day, picking cotton or picking the tobacco and taking care of the animals and so forth. The task system here in the low country had you one, had your one specific task that you had to get done and completed that day. How much time it required for you to do that was really based on what the task was itself. But once your task for the day was complete, that really kind of lets you loose as a slave in the, in the lowland region for the rest of that day and really cultivating different products, cultivating different skills, hunting, fishing, pursuing their own needs, and basically taking care of families. It was a different system in just this particular area because of that. Now, the painting that's on the screen here, very notable painting. Uh, I'd like to share this with you because it is an indicator of the actual culture of the area, or pretty close, pretty close. Uh, at, during this time and well beyond, there was a tendency to, um, to exaggerate or to caricature the African-Americans of a particular period. That went on from the antebellum period right through uh, the war, the Civil War, and particularly through 
the reconstruction period when Africans had more rights. So it was a common thing to have the lives, the personality and persona of the Africans caricaturized and often negatively or in, a, in, or, or in misunderstanding of who the people were, their culture, their, their rituals and so forth. But this painting called The Old Plantation is very noted for its non-stereotypical depiction of Gullah people. The dancing, the gathering, very much, very much not only in, 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 in some form of accuracy for scale and for depiction of people, but also in depiction, if you look in the background, you'll notice the, the landscape itself, you'll notice the residents, you'll notice the gathering of people in, in, in this painting, as well as some of the instruments that people are playing. You'll notice that a uh, very sophisticated looking instrument that's actually reflective of a banjo itself. Uh, you'll notice the stick that the center that the, that the center character is holding. And you'll also notice the, uh, the other instruments that look like, um, look like rattles. They're characteristic of a Mende and neighboring tribes that they're actually carrying these instruments. So you look at dress, you look at the artistic depiction, you look at headdress, and you look at what appears to be the type of movement of the people in that painting. It tells a lot of the culture, which was rarely actually depicted accurately during that time. All right, um, getting on with it, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about not only the culture that was present, but the communication during that time of enslaved Africans along with their European their European captors. There were different dialects present in the language. And although they looked rather rudimentary or almost, uh, almost uh, warped and bastardized, they are not really. If you look at the languages, I'm gonna show them to you in the next slide, you'll see some blends of English language as we know it today along with some of the vernacular and some of the dialects that were reflective of the Africans of the time. The, the dialects were actually blended. And if you look at that, this list that's up now, you can see some of the words that have actually been blended together to formulate the, 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 Gullah, the Gullah and the Geechee language of the time. Um, bi village, is a village. Uh, better is better. Bear is bare bones. And some of these words are very liter literal. And some of the words were a little bit more in in encoded. Some are a little more encoded. So there's actually some of this that actually blended around literally because they were the dialects of the Africans combined with the English of their captors at the time that gave you these dialects of words. And some of them, as I said, from the list there are very, very literal. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Um, again, you're just a wealth of knowledge on, you all are a wealth of knowledge from Kevin to Jocelyn, um, amazing presentation. Um, that really is something I just love hearing about the Gullah and Geechee people and the different types of systems and they're basically the totally different culture of those enslaved people um, that differed from the mainland um, enslaved people. So I wanna talk about really quickly or just briefly about ring shout and praise houses. Um, praise houses, this is our modern day churches. Um, I call myself the, the resident um, church kid. Um, I grew up in church and I from I, I, I want to say the earliest ages of maybe three and have never left church. I've been in church since. So these are, if you see that picture on the left, it says praise house, which also can be called prayer houses. These are the first structures that enslaved people built as places where they can go praise, where they can go um, pray, where they can go express themselves and, you know, practice their religious traditions, which normally were the Christian traditions. Um, a lot of these buildings um, revealed the struggle of enslaved people to maintain their humanity in the midst of in a very obviously inhumane system. And 
a lot of these more, not even just in the antebellum of South Carolina plantations, but uh, North Carolina and a lot of the Southern states, a lot of the enslaved people would erect these praise houses as both the epitome of slave culture and symbols of resistance to slaveholders oppressive version of Christianity. Um, this is again, the, the basis of where you start to see what we have as our modern day church. And so it was, it was just a, a simple structure, generally um, clapboard structures built by slaves themselves. Um, praise houses were erected with the knowledge that if not always the complete approval of the master class. So they actually allowed, semi allowed this thought process. Let me move on for you. So meetings in praise houses usually occurred during the week rather than on Sunday morning. So now most of us go to church or a lot of people go to church. I would say I go to church on Sunday mornings and a lot of people go to church on Sunday mornings, but a lot of these praise house meetings happen during the week and not just on Sunday mornings. Um, it, it, it's the, the pious master preferred that their enslaved people to be in attendance at white dominated churches where sermons but trust the slave system with carefully chosen scriptural text. That's a very key key thought process. Carefully chosen um, scriptural text. Uh, the simple art architecture and aesthetics of the praise houses mirrored the non liturgical style of slave religion. So, enslaved Christians favored empty space. So, if you go in, in a lot of churches, you have a lot of different pews, you have a lot of different, um, normally you have a pulpit, which is the front, um, you have the, the, the different side areas where maybe, you know, there may be musicians, you have an altar and kneelers in some churches, but in a praise house, it was basically bare bones to some degree because they wanted the space to really freely express themselves because they wanted to get into this thought process of the ring shout, which is a, a general open of a circle and being in that circle to just sing and pray and, and, and go forth in worship. So that is the next thought process is ring shouts. Ring shouts are, are a very, very important part where again, when we're connecting the music, worshipers move in a circle it was like basically it was almost like uh what is it ring around the rosy it's a circle but they're moving and they're stomping and they're clapping and keeping rhythm and they would sing to 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 the rhythms that they were clapping and they would praise and and if you notice i think it's in the picture if you notice the walking stick and the plank which substitute for drums because you know in our modern day church i'm a i'm a drummer as well in our as eric mentioned in our church and so i play the uh uh six piece set with cymbals and all these amazing things but obviously they didn't have that so they used a walking stick and a board on the ground as the drums um which obviously were banned in the united states for enslaved people so it says some scholars believe the ring shout descends from Islamic word shot, which means to circle the sacred Kaaba at Mecca counterclockwise. That is the basic thought process of the, the construction of the ring that they would create and that they would move in, in during the ring shout. And a lot of our songs, the songs that they would sing during ring shouts were most of the time upbeat. As you can see, they're not in this picture, they're not just like sitting still and sitting, they're moving in a circle, they're dancing, they're clapping. So they would be singing songs like, up above my head, up above my head, there's music in the air, there's music in the air, up above my head, up above my head, there's music in the air, there's music in the air, up above my head, I hear music in the air, I really do believe, I really do believe there's a heaven somewhere. So songs like that, or songs like, Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in. So many different songs that we sing in church started out as ring shout songs, as songs that they would sing while they were in these circles. Uh, the joy of dancing and singing inherent in the ring shout would contribute to the development of the energetic life affirming gospel music. I am first and foremost, a gospel artist. I also, I would say I'm equal parts gospel, blues, and soul. 
And, but uh, my roots are in gospel music. And if you know gospel music, most gospel songs are very up-tempo. If you think about artists like Kirk Franklin, if you think about artists like Donnie McClurkin, if you think about um, Pastor Shirley Caesar, a lot of it is really a lot of hand clapping, foot stomping songs because it was just that energetic life affirming thought process of praising. And the, the crazy part or the thing that jumps out to me is that these amazing people were doing this in the midst of slavery, in the midst of one of the hardest times of their life, they still use this time to dance and sing and praise and uplift themselves because after semi being beaten down all day, you need something to uplift yourself. So that just is, is a little bit about ring shouts and praise houses. And our last, our final thought process where we really want to answer this question now, and we really want to hear your feedback is, again, as African-Americans have struggled to overcome injustice, how have they used music to convey their stories and change American history? So after talking about everything that we talked about from when Jocelyn and Jim talked about the, um, the, the, the Senegambia and, the, and Senegal and the West Africans and the Griots and everything that they talked about. And then mixing, mixing that in with, with Kevin when he talked about the Gullah and the Geechee people and all the music and the art and amazing stories that they told. And then even now mixing in the ring shouts and the praise houses. Let's answer this question. As African-Americans have struggled to overcome injustice, how have they used music to convey their stories and change American history? And I already see some some amazing some amazing things coming up so let, let's let's get some answers type your answers in the chat what do you what do you guys think from everything that we talked about today what are you what is your response to this kind of question how have they used music to convey their stories and change american history let's see let's see Pulling up the chat now. I didn't have it up. Sorry if anyone did post anything in the chat. I'm just pulling it up, but. So, oh, so, uh, Dwight said songs like Strange Fruit bring awareness. Ooh, that's good. That's that was re that's that's really good. Um, that's really good. Sometimes a message or story might not be obvious in song to someone outside of the situation. Music or song might seem less threatening to the status quo. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. If you're talking about um, using music as a, sometimes a buffer, music has been the vehicle, and because of its Sorry, and because of its, they're coming in so fast, and because of its genuineness and sincerity caught the attention of anyone with a heart. Yes, yes, so many, so many. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to most of them, but they're flying in at me. Uh, I'll, William, I'll, I'll read this one from uh, Mr. Nath. Uh, music has been the vehicle, and because of its uh, genuineness and sincerity has caught the attention of anyone with a heart. Yes, yes. Thank you. So Chris said, as a form of protest, staying free in the minds, hanging on to cultural roots, sending messages of solidarity, hope, and salvation to one another in a concealed way. Yes, exactly. As to, to, to the thought process of, like you said, conceal, uh, like music as a buffer or a way to conceal certain things in that, like I talked about in the ring shout, there were allowed to, you know, sing songs that were, had a Christian theme. The masters didn't really, you know, they have pretty much allowed that to a degree. So that would help them conceal and sing and say, oh, slave spirituals, the blues, jazz, hip hop, rap, rock and roll, and even heavy metal can tell the stories of African-Americans. Yes, even heavy metal. That is, that's not a genre that's talked about a lot when you talk about um, African-Americans, I feel like. But heavy metal conveys a really, really powerful message uh, and tells a really powerful story. We Shall Overcome is an anthem. Appreciate yes. It. All right. So uh, I just, I want to stop here because we are at time. 
we have reached the very end. Look at that. We are at the very end, and uh, we appreciate you all so much as well. Uh, we now have the after party. So some of you might be aware of this. Uh, this is our lesson plan for the after party. So um, I really appreciate these answers and you all participating. So uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna read through the entire lesson plan, but the uh, basis of this after party is uh, centered around this underground railroad message uh, coded message song that we will all want you to create yourselves. So let's go into it. Uh, we have the slides here and we'll just go down very, very quickly because we'll just give you a very brief uh, run through of this. So there's slides on like steal away here. Uh, you'll be able to go through follow the drinking gourd and we have multiple examples of these coded message songs. And basically what we want you to do is to create your own coded spiritual. If you go down, next slide. Uh, you'll take the song, This Little Light of Mine, and there's an example in the link of Adam singing to a track. You'll hear uh, how he sings over that. And then you take the, the very last slide here. You go to the next slide, uh, and you'll write your own coded message song. So uh, you'll take uh, an example here. Adam, I'll let you uh, read this, and then uh, we'll take it out. So this one is a is a brief example. Walk towards the light, walk towards a little light. Wait for the dark of night. You see the Jordan shine. They will only smell the pine. Follow the glow of light. The full moon shines so bright. Jump on the train. You will reach the end of the lane. That's just a small example of the, the thought process of writing the song to the tune of this little light of mine. Great. So that's the end of that. Uh, we'll get to the very last slide here. And this is the evaluate for the next steps. Uh, you can sign up at the OERproject.com, visit the after party, and as well, uh, complete today's exit ticket. I'm going to give you the link right here uh, for that ticket. Here we go. Uh, Jason is also with us today. He's part of the OER project. And we wanted to thank Jason Wilkinson for finding us and giving us this platform to be able to talk about this history. So Jason, I'm posting uh, this link here, and then I'm going to post this link right here as well. And I believe, Jason, you can let me know, is this correct? Is that the, tick is that the exit ticket right there, the link to the tiny URL, is that correct? Sorry, I always have trouble unmuting. Yes, yeah, so that's the exit ticket. You probably need to repost the after party link. But if you're somebody who is going to be joining us there, um, pretty much something to note about the after party is it's going to be going on immediately until whenever the party dies down. So that's going to be, in some cases, a week, maybe more than that. The idea really is we want to keep the conversation going. If you have some big ideas, some lasting questions, if you want to share um, your own coded message uh, song, if you want to dive into that those lesson plans and ask some questions about it that'll be a really great place to go and to spin the funnel your your ideas those questions um so that link will i'll be i'll repost that in the chat but it's also going to be coming to you via email anyone who registered for this course is going to get our next steps email and now we'll share all of those links all over again um but the goal here is to really keep this conversation this community going uh for, for the foreseeable future Absolutely. And once again, thank you, Jason, for having us. It's uh, And thank you to all the teachers out there that are staying up uh, beyond your school hours and are here and are genuinely curious to learn about this. It's incredible uh, that you're here and you're taking the time you care about this. And we care about it. You can tell it uh, in the hearts of Kevin's sculptures, in the voice of Adam, in the in the percussion playing and, and the joy in Jocelyn's music, uh, in Jim's uh, genuine curiosity and, and um, drive to create these lesson plans. So uh, the entire team really, it's just, it would not be a program without them. So I just wanna thank my team as well. You the teachers so much for caring about this. Thank you as well. I see some answers in the chat. Uh, this was great, learned so much. We learn, we learn from you as well as you were answering those uh, those questions about the gullet, about our essential question, the uh, breakout rooms, we, we learned from those answers. Those were incredible. So thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Nath asked, can you teach this uh, lesson plan? Yes, I'm giving you this lesson plan for free. The Underground Railroad lesson plan. You take it, you run with it, you do what you want. It is yours. That is my gift to you for staying this late with us, staying over 90 minutes. That is my gift in the after party. You can take that link. You can teach it. Uh, send me an email. I'm going to, I'm also going to give my email here. If you have any questions, um, Jason, do I have your permission to give my email here? Great. Um, so everyone, that is my email for the blues and beyond. Uh, please send me an email if you have any questions about the program. And, uh, even if you have questions on how to run the underground railroad lesson plan, I'm happy to answer that. No problem. Um, so that is my email. If you have any questions on how we run our program, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, and yeah, so that closes out our presentation for the night. Um, after party link is there. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Um, so if you want to click on that, that will take you to the after party. And I believe that uh, that takes us home, right? Jason, are we all set? We're all set. So yeah, if anyone has any additional questions, I'd suggest going over to the after party. That'd be a great place for uh, you to find some answers. But for everyone else, thank you for joining us and we will uh, see you at our next event. Absolutely. And I'm going to post my website here, our website for the Blues and Beyond. And you can go and peruse through the website. And Eric, what I'd probably suggest is just drop it into the after party because this is going to disappear once I close the room. Okay. But the after party it. will live on, obviously, for. All right, perfect. That's great. All right. Well, thank you, um, Jason. I guess you and I could stay on for a sec, uh, or if that's okay, I just have some sure. after party questions. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you to my team as well. All you beautiful teachers out there, thank you as well. <laughs> thank Have you a great well. Thank you. Take care, everybody. It's great to see you tonight. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Have everybody. a good night, everybody. Night. Thank you, Kevin, as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See ya. Good one. All right, Adam. Thank you. All right. All right. How do you feel? Good. I, I, I remember my, uh, my, uh, instructor from Berkeley told me if you prepare for anything, then you're going to do a good job in life. That's, that's what he always told me. He said, yeah. you specifically, he's like, if you prepare, cause he knew me really well. So I felt like we prepared and we, we brought it. So yeah, I think it went really well. Mm -hmm. What do you think? No, I think it went really well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, no complaints. I think the a little bit of exposition in the front end went a little longer than I would have loved, but I think realistic exposition in in terms well, of just what? like a lot of the background. Like, I think there's this kind of like there's a tendency sometimes I think for people when people get a little nervous sometimes they go on a little bit too long in terms of the kind of like some of the explanations around things, mm -hmm. and you can see that going on a little bit with Adam. You can see a little bit going on with Jocelyn where like some of the kind of scripts you can tell it got stretched out a little bit longer than it should. Mm -hmm. The here, actually, let me 